Okay. Let me invite our second panel to take their seats up front and uh, welcome everyone back and online. Uh, thank you for your waiting patiently. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce the second panel, the Y panel. Um, and I will leave it to the moderator, Jessica Badke, to introduce the panelists. Jessica Becky is a China file senior editor where she researches China's domestic political and social affairs. She served as the State Department's Bureau of Intelligence and Research Analyst for nearly eight years prior to joining China file. And please join me in welcoming her and this panel on why is genocide committed. Thank you. Give myself a little clap there. Um, Thanks so much for having me, and thank you to Hunter and Human Rights Watch for setting this up, and our fearless leader, Tung Biao, for setting this up. Um, I'm just going to really, really quickly introduce our distinguished panelists here, and then I'm going to turn it over to them to talk. Um, the first speaker we'll have is Zubaira Shamsedin. She's an outreach coordinator at the Uyghur Human Rights Project. She's also vice president of the World Uyghur Congress for the 2021 to 2024 term. Second speaker will be Ilshad Kokbode a Uyghur activist, vice chairman of the World Uyghur Congress Executive Committee, and also a Chinese language writer and blogger. Our third speaker will be Tang Biao, is an academic lawyer um, who's currently the Hauser Human Rights Scholar at Hunter College and Pose and Visiting Professor at the University of Chicago. His research focuses on criminal justice, human rights, social movement, and political transition in China. And last but not least, we have Magnus Biskesha, uh, a professor in the anthropology department in Cornell, and he's, his research concerns ethnic relations and political anthropology in Southeast Asia. So this is a really good panel to talk about with apologies to our previous moderator, what I actually think is a far more difficult question, which is why is this happening? And in some ways it's uh, impossible to answer. Uh, I feel like this is one like the, a very human existential question. Why, why would anyone choose to do this to other people? Um, and with that very, very difficult question that I've just posed, uh, I'll turn it over to Zubaira to get us started. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, <clears throat> thanks to Human Rights Watch, Hunter College for organizing this timely event. I would especially like to thank my friend, Dr. Ting Biao, and the other friend, friends' valuable work in support of the Uyghurs and giving me an opportun opportunity to present. Let me um, directly move to my talk, why China is committing genocide against Uyghurs. In the last century, the Nazis believed Germans were racially superior. They believed Jews were a threat to the so-called German racial community, while Jews were the primary victims. The Nazis also targeted other groups for persecution and the murder. The Nazis claimed that the Roma, people with disabilities, some Slavic people, especially Russian and Poles, and the black people were biologically inferior. The regime persecuted other groups because of politics, ideology, or behavior. The groups included communists, socialists, Jewish witnesses, gay men, and people the Nazis called associates and professional criminals. As a result of this government's insanity, the world witnessed an unforgettable genocide against Jewish people and creating a scar in human history. Now let's come back to Chinese government. The Chinese government's attitude and the purpose of repression against the Uyghurs as uh, Peru speaker, uh, my friend Nuri Turkel mentioned, break their lineage, break their roots, break their connections, and break their origins. Completely show up the roots of two-faced people, dig them out, and the war to fight these two-faced people until the end. The declaration was announced openly through the mouth of a Chinese religious of affairs official on August 10th, 2017, on a Xinhua Weibo page. In order to implement the declaration 
along with many other discriminatory ethnic laws. The Chinese government policies included 48 reasons to place Uyghurs in, a, in concentration camps. It can be any religious expression, as my previous friends uh, spoke. Even growing a bed, wearing a head scarf, praying at home, or fasting during the Ramadan, attending a traditional wedding, praying at funeral, any contact with foreign countries, and more. In reality, just being Uyghur is enough to be taken away into a camp. The government has rounded up an estimated two to three million Uyghurs into mass internment camps since 2016, out of a population of about 12 million. The 12 million is the official figure, which may not be reliable. We call them concentration camps because innocent people are hauled into these camps based on their religion and ethnic identity. There is no judicial process. There is no appeal. The same repression, detainment of Uyghurs who exist before. Uyghur Human Rights Project, where I work currently, officially documented the atrocities through its report since 2004, including my brother Abdrazak Shamsuddin's case, which is this person. This is my brother. He was arrested in 1998 in connection with Gulja massacre that happened on February 5th, 1997 in Gulja city of East Turkestan. On February 5th, 1997, young Uyghurs peacefully protested against Chinese government's unfair treatment of Uyghurs in Gulja city, my hometown. Protesters asked the government to do more to help with rising problem of drug and alcohol abuse affecting young Uyghurs, punish Chinese drug sellers from mainland China who were pushing drugs to young Uyghurs and respect religious and cultural freedom. Instead of listening to protesters and investigating the root cause of social disorder within the city, Chinese armed force opened fire towards the protesters, arrested, killed, and made, made, made disappear hundreds of young Uyghurs after the massacre. Since this date, my family, was, my family has fallen apart, lost and suffered hugely as a result of the crackdown. In the aftermath of the massacre, among the arrested were my sister, my niece, and one of my brothers and several cousins. In 1999, my arrested brother, Abdrazak Shamsuddin, who I mentioned above in the picture, was sentenced to life imprisonment in a secret trial without witnesses, a lawyer, or even a, any family member's attendance. It's been 24 years. He's still in Chinese jail as a political prisoner. In April 1998, my nephew was shot dead while he was gathering with his friends during the month of Ramadan for a special prayer, which is performed on the 17th day of Ramadan. He was only 22 years old at the time, a student who returned home during his school break from Egypt. In 1998, my 24 year old cousin, Abdul Khalaq Abdurashid was sentenced to death in open trial in Gulja city and immediately executed after the trial. You can search his information from Amnesty reports as well. My sister, currently she lives in Australia and along with other cousins attend the trial. It was a dark day for Gulja people. Around 20 young Uyghurs were judged on that day. When it came to Abd Halak's turn, judge said, you have confessed your crime and you are sentenced to death. He replied loudly and fearlessly with the heavy shackles on his feet and hands. If you face the torture as I did, even dog wouldn't stand for, for the suffer. Then one of the guards shut his mouth. 
All the young Uyghurs sentenced to death were paraded in the back of an open truck on the streets of Gulja. Then they were taken to the outskirts of Gulja city and shot in the head in front of the crowd. My sister witnessed this cruelty and they became speechless. After the killing, Chinese police came to my uncle's house and forced him to pay a bullet fee for the bullet that they used to shoot my cousin. I don't often talk about my family's experience, but I have realized that it is important for people to hear from witness like me. I am a direct witness to atrocities. I and my family survivors of these atrocities. East Turkestan has long been the epicenter for trade between China and the West, not just for its strategic location. The fertile land has proven to be incredibly profitable, profitable a major source of natural gas, minerals, phosphorus, and many other valuable resources. The incredibly beautiful scenery also attracts thousands of tourists, giving China all the more reason reason to incorporate East Turkestan into its newly formed Belt and the Road Initiative. In my view, the motivation for the brutal crackdown on the Uyghurs is this need for absolute power to maintain control over economic resources and over people who did not voluntarily assimilate under decades of Communist Party control. We a separate ethno-religious identity, the Uyghurs, a threat to Xi personality cult. The party is eliminating this threat with policies that amount to a genocide. The genocide will ensure that the Uyghur homeland can be utilized for its natural resources and to aid the Chinese Communist Party in retaining power and reaching its economic and political goals. Through the Belt and the Initiative, which starts in the Uyghur homeland. China not only garners resources for itself, it colonizes each land that it touches. Nothing ends well for those whom China colonized. We need only to look at uh, Southern Mongolia or Inner Mongolia, Tibet and Hong Kong to realize the extra brutality of the Chinese regime, even more brutal than the horrible treatment of Han Chinese people. In comparison with Western imperialism, what China has in store will be much worse. Uyghurs are in desperate need of UN governments, concerned NGOs, worldwide action to condemn China for its genocide. As the Chinese Communist Party continues to perpetuate the myth that any criticism of its action is generated by the West to prevent China's rise. In reality, China is not rising. It is dismantling the world order that humans put centuries of effort into create a space that every living thing can breathe freely at its own will. Thank you. Thank you. Ilshad, would you like to speak next? Thank you for the Hunter College and uh, Human Rights Watch. Also my dear friend, Teng Biao. Uh, when we say uh, umpire, we don't have a consensus, uh, consensus uh, definition. And so I say a traditional umpire. A few days back, I was reading another one uh, book about colonialism empire and the book starting page says the uh, soviet empire was the last one uh, breaking down but if we look at china after before the nationalist government what we call the china manchu empire and then manchu empire was uh, overthrew nationalist government communist government they inherited almost inherited or forcefully occupied all the manchus land 
So we call Manchu Empire, but we never call China Empire. It uh, seems like a modern concept, country or state. Actually, it's not. It's not a modern concept state. That is a genocide come from. Why I say it's genocide come from? If we look at nationalist government, what they call Urumqi, Dihua, what it is mean? Enlightenment. What it call Manas, Guihua, what it is meaning? Civilize. So the Chinese national government come to East Turkestan to enlighten Uyghur people, to civilize Uyghur people. That's their mission. So we are inferior people. That's their concept to the Uyghur people. And then came the communist rule. And from my personal experience, I'm uh, same as with Zubaida in a, from Wulja. And when I know something, I was always playing with my grandpa in a carpenter factory. And later I happened to know that was a mosque my grandpa was imam in that mosque. And one night I remember, I wake up in midnight, I found that my grandma, grandpa was eating something. I was so wondered, what are they eating in the midnight? And I look at the window, the door, it was all covered by the carpet. And then I asked my grandpa, what is happening? Why you eat in midnight? This is Ramadan. And then first time I know it is Ramadan and they have to cover the, all the house. And my grandpa specifically instructing me, never ever tell anyone. If you tell, we will be taken away. And then come to my father. I came to the, another one city to study Chinese. And one day from my father's uh, the working place, came a few Chinese leaders, and they were checking all of our house. And then my father was very scared, and then after they left, I asked my father, what happened? And they say, our house don't have Mao Zedong's picture, don't have the leadership's picture, so we need to buy that. And later, I happened to know my father was kicked out from the he was the national, uh, the Uyghur East Turkestan National Army's soldier. And so he was transferred to the police in the beginning. And because my father was the national government soldier, ex-soldier, so he was kicked out from the police after the communists take over. So he was uh, all his life working in a railway station, taking the uh, very, laborer's job. And when it's come to my person, myself, when I went to the university in Dalian Technology University, studying in China, and what the school uh, university administration in the first meeting told us, you are the selected Uyghurs, you come to here to learn knowledge and back to your hometown to enlighten, civilize the backward Uyghur people. That was what we are chosen to be our mission. Then we know, oh, okay, we are again inferior. Even though I speak fluent Chinese, I can write in Chinese, but still, because I am Uyghur, I'm still inferior in the government's view. Then came back after university, I become a associate professor in a college. It was a real vocational college, not like now they called. And I had a class of minority, uh, they call it minority, Uyghur, Kazakhs. And two things I will give you example. One is, one, uh, after this student completed their four years college, in the last year they will go to the factory for three months in tents internship. So I brought them to a, to a factory and the boss was a Chinese. 
and we were talking in the beginning was very nice conversation and eventually he find out i'm a little different teacher are you uyghur i said yes oh we don't accept any minority in here i said why i asked him why he said because one you guys eat different second you are not very disciplined third the uyghur people is very lazy and when I go into that factory, went into the factory, in the front of the gate, they have a statue, one Uyghur, one Kazakh, and one Chinese. And I was furious. So I asked him, why you built that statue? You are saying you are uh, the national unity propagating, and but you are rejecting, openly discriminating Uyghurs. And he told me, you can complain to the regional government, but I'm telling you, no, I won't accept you guys. No minority. So I need to leave. And one Chinese boss uh, from the school administration, he was with me. He just dragged me out because I was so furious. I just want to argue with him. And that was one. <clears throat> And uh, another one is after the 97, uh, Zubairi's brother that uh, massacre in Wulja, 97th of February, when I was visiting my home in Wulja, coming back, we were stopped in the mountain, the bus. And the Chinese police came to the bus, said, everyone, Uyghur, come down. We will check your ID. And in home, my, uh, which I was sitting in the bus was me and another one Uyghur. And I asked them, why Uyghur? We are citizens of China with your constitution. And I am a associate professor. With your, the title level, I am a middle class. Why? And he told me, you are Uyghur. If you have argument, you can stay here. We have a crowded detention center. And next day, we will send you to the Wuljas Police Bureau. You can appeal over there. And I'm scared. I said, OK, you check, do whatever you, you want to. And then this, my attitude, made the Chinese government and the uh, university and my municipal police I am a target. So eventually they take me out from my position, demoted me to do the other things. So I have to leave. I left China, fled China 2003, 2004 for retaliation. They killed my brother in the daylight in a restaurant, stabbed him to death in a lunch. 2014, they took my elder sister because I sent her some money to support a single mother with two kids. Since that, my elder sister disappeared. And in 2018, I learned another two of my sister in a concentration camp in Kuitun. And with whole family. And the concentration camp, Chinese party boss, told my sister in front of the whole concentration camp, until your brother in America, he dies, you guys cannot out from here. It is in New York, a New Yorker journal. And I don't know if my mom's still alive, if three sister is still alive. I have no any news until today. And the implication is we are left alone. I have decent job in here. I'm a proud American here, but I don't have any life enjoyment. Be frank to you. I think I am brave enough to bear this all. But recently this video come out from Wulja, from others. I couldn't watch it. I just share them. I couldn't watch it. 
I'm so desperate. I just want to hear my mom's voice. Want to know if my sister is alive. That's the only we want now. For me, that's become more dear. This is a genocide. Thank you. I just want to say thanks to both of you. I know that this is really difficult to talk about, um, but I appreciate both of you speaking on this. Tung Biao, are you ready? I'm told you can just use the clicker to advance and, your slides. I uh, have a, a PowerPoint, uh, some slides. Um, so uh, thank you uh, for sharing your uh, personal experience. And thank you for like uh, uh, Ruth and Abbas, um, uh, Juhar. And so it's really, really hard. Um, and that's also example that, you know, I, as a Han Chinese, I do have the uh, moral obligation to uh, speak up for the Uyghurs, for all the victims of the concentration camps and the, the genocide. And I, I contribute a bit to this, uh, this uh, conference. I, that, that's really my obligation. Um, and I'll um, explain uh, the, uh, the reasons behind the, the Uyghur genocide. I'll show that uh, the Chinese Communist Party uh, not only has the motive to commit the genocide, but also has uh, abilities, has experience, and has the legal and political con condition to commit the genocide. Um, is the um, PPT ready? Um, um, oh. oh, sorry. Yes. It's working. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah. So um, the, uh, the 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 Uyghur people and the uh, the people in uh, East Turkey area uh, has um, uh, uh, a long um, uh, complicated history. Um, and uh, there, there were uh, conflicts, there were uh, wars, and um, there, uh, there were uh, humiliation, occupation, and so it's a, uh, and and uh, uh, after uh, nineteen, we, we can see the wars um, between uh, the the Uyghurs and the uh, the Turkic people and the Han Chinese, and after nineteen forty nine, of course, the Chinese. Uh, Communist Party established a totalitarian uh, regime, and that that brutal uh, rule uh, created uh, more tension and hatred um, in uh, in East Turkestan. Um, and then um, the uh, the economic. Uh, exploitation in uh, in Xinjiang. Uh, several speakers have mentioned the uh, Back and Road Initiative and Xinjiang locates in a, uh, in a significant rural, um, um, uh, rural, in a significant area uh, in the Back and Road. We can see here uh, the uh, Back and Road, the uh, Pakistan Economic uh, Corridor. Um, and the um, so the Bingtuan, the Xinjiang production and the construction corps. Um, so the, the the most important um, positions, um, the um, the party and and government positions are are uh, possessed by uh, the Han Chinese people. And and many of you mentioned the the daily uh, humiliation, the discrimination against the uh, uh, Uyghurs. And the, um, the uh, global narrative um, uh, Islamophobia, especially after uh, 9 one one and the, the Chinese Communist Party uh, manipulated um, the, the, the global narrative of uh, anti-Muslim uh, sentiment. And they, they uh, labeled, they demonized the, the whole nation, the whole uh, people, um, Turkey and, and 
and other um, uh, the Uyghurs and other Turkey people as uh, the Sangu Sili as the, the extremist, uh, uh, separatist, and uh, and terrorist. So the um, the the concentration camps, um, um, you know, it does not does not come from from the the. Uh, the vacuum and the uh, the Communist Party persecutes all religions in China, and 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 the uh, the cultural genocide in uh, in Tibet and the high, I'll, I'll also um, um, talk about the, the high tech totalitarianism uh, established and strengthened uh, in recent years, and there are many many uh, actual judicial and actual legal uh, detentions in the PRC. Uh, his uh, PRC history, and and these are uh, extrajudicial uh, detention uh, systems um, w that have been abolished, and and like uh, the investigation and deten uh, detention, uh, custody and repatriation system uh, targeted uh, migrant workers and re-education through labor uh, and detention for education that. Um, and uh, uh, and targeted um, um, targeted uh, sex workers and their clients, and there are also also these kind of detention f uh, facilities uh, targeting the uh, criminal suspects and other uh, prisons, and 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 many other actual judicial and actual legal uh, detentions are still in use, uh, like uh, uh, the RSDL. It's it's in the uh, criminal procedure law, but it's still uh, still uh, actual judicial uh, detention. There's no uh, no judicial review in in, in this and other uh, other uh, systems like uh, the isolation for uh, uh, for mandatory drug treatment and involuntary uh, psychiatric commitment, and uh, there are uh, black deals all over China uh, targeting uh, petitioners and and fang min sang fang zhe and and other uh, like a legal education center. So this we should uh, we should um, bear in mind this the legal education center uh, all over China. Um, uh, mainly targeting Falun Gong practitioners. That's, there, there are a lot of similarity uh, b between the, uh, the the persecution of uh, uh, Falun Gong people and the, the, the current concentration camps in uh, in Xinjiang. So since 1999, uh, more than 4,800 people, Falun Gong people, have been uh, tortured uh, to death in the, in the uh, in legal education center and and in uh, Lao Jiao uh, legal um, education uh, re-education through labor camps. We can from the names we can see how the CCP um, uh, is obsessed with uh, re-education, like uh, uh, Lao Gai, the re-education through labor, uh, legal education center, study sessions like that. And 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 then this kind of um, uh, I, you know, they have nothing to do with education. So in the concentration camps in in East Turkestan, it, they they are uh, brainwashing people. And in this context, the brainwashing um, is you know goes closely with torture, with with uh, the um, you know uh, the or at least the intimidation of torture. So in, in China, the, the, the brainwashing won't function uh, without torture or the possibility of, uh, of torture. And of course, the, uh, the, the concentration camps um, uh, are, are different from, from other actual uh, legal, actual uh, judicial detentions, and they are uh, targeting a, a certain culture, um, you know, ethnic and uh, and, and religion. And uh, Chen Quanguo, the, the former party secretary, um, uh, he uh, he was the leader, the party leader in in Tibet, in Tibet, uh, Tibetan uh, autonomous region. And he uh, in Tibet already uh, adopted this this, uh, this method, like uh, the the mass arrest and uh, and uh, the. Uh, surveillance and uh, travel restrictions and 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 so he has the the playbook um, 
Um, so he took those uh, those methods from Tibet to uh, to uh, Xinjiang, and uh, the the Chinese authorities persecute all religions, every religion. But some religions are um, more persecuted than others. So the most persecuted um, religions are uh, the Uyghur Muslim and uh, Tibetan Buddhism and the Falun Gong. And the, uh, since Xi Jinping came to power, uh, the uh, the Communist Party uh, was facing a series of uh, crises. Uh, it seems to be, um, you know, the party seemed to be very uh, confident and uh, powerful, but actually uh, they were facing the uh, economic crisis, political crisis, social crisis, and ideological uh, crisis. And they feel it's necessary to. Uh, crack down on all religions, on the uh, the uh, civil society, the human rights movement, and internet, and uh, and uh, college, uh, you know, uh, universities and media, and the um, the Communist Party um, has been using the high level technologies to establish the, what I uh, call uh, high tech totalitarianism. And they are using the, the big data, the artificial intelligence, the social credit system, and the uh, DNA collections uh, to, uh, to um, uh, control the society and the individuals. Um, it's, it's really uh, unprecedented uh, high tech totalitarianism. And here are uh, some pictures of the uh, the surveillance cameras and um, the DNA collection, uh, AI, and uh, the and um, uh, notably the the Communist Party is using health code, uh, which is supposed to deal with the the pandemic, uh, to control the travel and uh, the the movement of uh, uh, dissidents, human rights activists, and and of course uh, and uh, many many other people. Uh, in uh, um, when they want want to defend their rights in in Henan, when they want their money back, and then suddenly their health code turned red. Um, so it's really a, a effective and a powerful tool uh, for the Communist Party to um, to control uh, the society and the people uh, completely. And and last one is the uh, the uh, racism with uh, Chinese characters. I think my professor uh, Fixo will talk about that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And it sounds like this is going to be a very direct lead in to what you are about to talk about. Already in. Um... Already in 2018, the UN Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination recognized uh, that China's then just launched new campaign against the Uyghurs and the Kazakhs was racist. When we ask why the Chinese regime is carrying out this deeply racist genocide, the intentional targeting of entire peoples and their identity for eradication, forcing them to be converted to be Chinese, I believe we must put these current events in a historical frame. The number one unresolved issue uh, in today's China is the legacy of the empires. Ever since the overthrow of the last dynasty in 1911, there has been a struggle over whether China should continue as an empire or modernize, and how? This is reflected, for example, symbolically in the struggles over the national flag and its design. Should it or should it not include the representation of the ethnically distinct peoples as components of China, or should they be uh, deleted uh, and erased? Above all, this is a struggle over the right to self-determination of those peoples who were once conquered by the Chinese empires. Now, the Chinese communists used to be anti-imperialists. And in the 1930s, they promised that if they gained power, the peoples conquered by the empires in the past, from the Hmong to the Tibetans to the Uyghurs, they would have the option of seceding 
and forming their own modern independent nations, apart from China. As we know, among the conquered peoples, only Mongolia managed to form a modern state still recognized today. The Uyghurs tried. Tibet had a fully functional state, but both were exterminated by the Chinese communists, whose original anti-imperialism was forgotten and replaced with the new embrace of the empire. First of all, they renamed the empire's conquest as the sacred territory of the nation. The People's Republic of China. The conquered peoples became minorities, internal colonies targeted by assimilation and development, quote unquote, under the so-called leadership of the newly defined Han Chinese and ethno-racial category now carrying uh, the former empire's uh, civilizational mission. Uh, the widespread racism that is found in China today against uh, the minorities is the empire's old attitude in new form. Like elsewhere in world history, this racism is born with the self-supremacy cultivated by imperialists. We are better than them. As such, it's also similarly systematic, and it's found not least in every single Chinese official. Typically, they are firmly convinced that uh, the manifest destiny of the minorities is their extinction, which is inevitable, since they are um, inferior. And they will give way in favor of the innately superior Han Chinese, who shall take over their land, their resources, and their people, too. This is unfortunately what a lot of Chinese officials believe. So over several decades in the 20th century, after 1949, when the communists took over, this the slow crushing of the minorities their slow assimilation continued across China, all the while uh, preserving a token recognition of their existence, often tokenized as colorful and feminized, always dancing, tokens of a primitive other designed to let the Chinese feel good about their supremacy. But then what's happened in the last decade is that the Communist Party has shed the previous pretenses and fully embraced their identity with the empires. So today there's no daylight between the Communist Party and the empires. School children are taught that the achievements, the conquests of the empires are China's achievements and glory. Today's China and the empires are one. And the critique of imperialism and its inequality and injustice of the past is forgotten. Museums are rearranged and so on. In August 2021, the current Communist Party chief even paid respects at the Qing Emperor Qianlong's temple, celebrating the world's worst genocide in the 18th century. The imperial ordered massacre of the Dzungars on, on the new frontier of Xinjiang in 1755, today explained not as mass murder, they killed hundreds of thousands of people, basically everybody, uh, but as an act beneficial to China's national unity. And this mantra, uh, which we hear so much today, national unity, is another battlefield in this war over the legacy of the empires. There are now ultra-nationalist ideologues, much like in Putin's Russia, who are influencing the official Chinese nationalism that we now see we could think of it as modeled on the once uh, current concept in Germany, Ein Volk, Ein Reich, Ein Führer. One people only in this country, speaking only one language and with only one culture in one country under one Führer or leader. And in this interpretation, which we're seeing now, a national unity means not only the absence of dissent uh, and, and which we just heard about from, from Tang Biao, uh, and the intolerance of public opinion and debate. For the minorities, it means that even the formal, if hollow, autonomy that was granted them since the 1950s is now seen as incompatible with the overall program of making China great again. As part of this, the Chinese ultra-nationalists nationalists, uh, demand the erasure of undesirable ethnics. And I believe that the government orchestrated multifaceted mass campaign we see now against the Uyghurs is the first step of a greatly accelerated plan to assimilate and erase uh, all those minorities 
something that was already seen as inevitable in the past, but which is now affected faster. Uh, erasing 12 to 50 million people is not infeasible. We've seen the draconian program of, of racist profiling, which is what all that surveillance really is. We've seen the ethno conversion camps. They are combined with the society wide destruction of all things Uyghur, monuments, memorials, etc., down to the interior design of the homes. Plus, we see the mass dispersed slave labor for the able bodied, still surviving. We see prisons or death for the intractable ones. And we see the mass confiscation of the children to be reared in Chinese only. All in all, we have to uh, believe this is a viable plan. The first five years of which have now been successfully concluded, as Adrian Zenz was discussing. Without us seeing effective countermeasures from abroad, including in the absence of even the threat of prosecution as specified in the United Nations Convention against uh, genocide. That some form of accountability, some sort of forceful measure uh, along those lines specified in convention, I think it was we need, it was, is what we need, sorry, is what we need to halt the genocide. I also feel that to achieve this, to halt the genocide, a very big help would be if more Chinese people themselves could pause and consider if they really want this con genocide to continue in their name, as is happening now. After all, this is also about what kind of country they want their own country uh, to be, what kind of country China should be for the Chinese. I have a footnote uh, inspired by uh, uh, Adrian's comments earlier in terms of comparative genocide studies, which I have also been engaged in because I'm teaching a class right now on genocide in general, as well as the genocides in China and in, in Burma. And um, I think one of the points that we are missing is that um, the Chinese mass forced assimilation of millions of people is actually a major similarity between China and the Nazis. I think we, uh, we focus sometimes only on the eradication of the Jews and uh, Roma and such minorities. And we forget that that was not the limit of the plan that the Nazis had in place. They were going to finish that work and then move on to the Germanification of tens of millions of occupied people. They were drawing up detailed plans for how to separate the people that they occupied in places such as Czechoslovakia, uh, Poland, etc., into categories of the Germanizable, the maybe Germanizable, and the un-Germanizable that would have to be uh, eliminated or deported. And that they were playing with those plans just that they, they, they were um, perfecting the plans of exterminating the Jews as they, as they went along. Here we are talking about what didn't happen because the Nazis were defeated. But this was on the books and it was already started to being implemented. And it's strikingly similar in approach to what the Chinese government is doing today. So I think this is another point of comparison that we should be making uh, with the, uh, the Nazis. The point is uh, they uh, building on this sense of um, self-supremacy, they decide that uh, this is a place that belongs to us, and those other people that live there, we will uh, either assimilate, force assimilate, or eradicate. Uh, all of this is part of, of the concept of genocide, uh, and uh, this is the way I think we should uh, regard it as we, as we compare. Thank you. Thanks to all of you for this um, incredibly fraught topic. It's really difficult to discuss um, at, at any time.
I am going to take my prerogative to ask a first question. So you guys did a really good job of contextualizing this in a sort of longer historical timeline, right? This, this is uh, partially the result of this imperial legacy. It's partially a result of um, nationalism and, and this feeling of racial superiority. Uh, they have brought a bunch of tools to bear that, that uh, the, the Chinese Communist Party has brought a bunch of tools to bear that they've used. Some are new, some are old. They've been used in a, in a bunch of different circumstances. Um, so I feel like we have a good grounding in the sort of longer historical arc. My question is, why did this ramp up so significantly in 2016 and 2017? And I, I know Chen Chuan Guo, who is the party secretary of Tibet, got moved to Xinjiang, but he seems like the symptom, not the disease. What can we, can anybody talk about sort of maybe the deeper reasons why this um, ramped up so significantly five years ago? Anybody can feel free to answer. I think um, it's going to connect to China's big ambition. It's not just a simply to wipe out the Uyghurs so they can be kind of successful. I think it's, we, can, we can look at from bigger picture. Um, you know, the Zhongguo, that means, you know, the kind of the power comes from the center and rules whole world. I think that mentality or that character drive China to do such a um, atrocities against the Uyghurs. I think Uyghurs just a simply the laboratory, you know, it's, it's just a simply experiment to experiment the Ch China's ambition to control the world. And that's the beginning, I guess. Uh, I completely agree. And I also think that uh, it has to do, the timing has to do with um, the progress of this uh, Belt and Road plan of expanding China's economic influence. I think it may be that uh, China's political leaders looked at um, their own Central Asian region and decided we cannot have any problem there, so let's uh, eradicate any possible problem that could arise from there. And that in turn, I think, um, is grounded in, um, in a fundamental um, uh, aversion to diversity and intolerance for diversity. I read an um, unconfirmed account of Xi Jinping's visit to Kashgar 2014, when he walked around the bazaar and saw the lively um, buzz of uh, people trading and uh, talking. And then they came to a secluded uh, meeting with only party officials, and he scolded them and said, what have you been doing for the last 70 years? Meaning, how is it that these people are still so different? Why have we allowed them to be so different? Why have we not assimilated them and made them Chinese yet? And this has been happening on your watch. So th this story gives an impression, uh, it's unconfirmed, but it certainly fits with uh, this in intolerance to uh, languages, cultural differences and, uh, that we see reflected all across China as uh, policies similar to those adopted in Xinjiang are being taken elsewhere as well. Just want to add a little bit. Uh, after 91, the Soviet empire was collapsed and then the Central Asian, as uh, our brothers uh, get independent, uh, Uzbek, Kazakh, Kyrgyz, China was alarmed. And they were uh, discussing what kind of policy to deal with Uyghur, because the Central Asian Republic's independence also gave, also gave Uyghur inspiration and for their self-rule. So after then, they were discussing in 2009, in 5th of July, in Urimchi happened a big uprising of the Uyghur. The trigger is, after the Soviet collapse, uh, the China's policy to the Uyghur was shifting, moving some Uyghur to inside China, and uh, they're intensifying the Chinese language education in Uyghurs. So this triggered the Uyghurs' uh, protest. After this protest, the Chinese government felt, how can these people in the capital can still have this big demonstration and this courage so then they openly 
uh, had some discussion in the Chinese scholar, specifically uh, in Beijing University have a, a scholar called Ma Rong, Tsinghua University, Huangang, and uh, also Hu Lianhe. These three uh, scholars uh, introduced so-called second generation of the minority policy, and which is basically now what the uh, Xi Jinping government is doing. And this 2009, 5th of July Uyghur uprising accelerated the Chinese assimilation policy. They found out that this should be dealt with. And I want to mention another one, Chinese military academic. His name is Dai Xu. He works for the Chinese Academy. And in 2010, in Shanghai Foreign Language University, he gave an open uh, speech in which he, uh, not exact quote, he said, in future, if China happened to have conflicted with the United States, United States can arm Uyghur in one night, 40 to 50,000 Uyghur to against us, which openly stating Uyghur is the enemy of the Chinese state. This is a trigger, I mean, the short answer. Thank you. He became the party secretary in uh, 20, uh, uh, 2012, and he visited Xinjiang in uh, 2014. And on the last day of his uh, visit in Xinjiang, and uh, uh, that uh, which was uh, May 30th, 2014, and there was an um, uh, attack in uh, Ulumji uh, railway station. So I think that might be. You know, of course, the, uh, a lot of decisions uh, were made before that, but uh, in terms of the, the concentration camps, the, the genocide, and I think that event might be uh, one of the triggers. Thank you. Do we have questions from online, or should I ask people in the room? Great. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Aaron Glasserman. I'm a, a postdoctoral researcher at um, Princeton University. Um, question to anyone who is interested in answering it. Um, to, how do you think the Chinese regime uh, sees the international response to what's going on? Do you think they are surprised by it, or is it more or less in line with what they expected? You've given sort of a very helpful historical perspective if it was kind of planned or a certain something that they are familiar with these these ways of uh, 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 forcibly assimilating people, presumably they would have anticipated also they may or may not have uh, received some international blowback. So if you could speak more about that, I'd be very grateful. Thank you. Uh, yes, Chinese government was a little bit surprised with the West reaction especially with the West reaction. Uh, because uh, for uh, 16, after the Europe happened, a lot of the terrorist attack in London, in, in Paris, in Amsterdam, the Chinese government assumed that's the best uh, time frame for them to start this and the label we were as a part of the international jihadist terrorist. And, but they didn't expect uh, our free world know what is a terrorism, what is not, what is a religion freedom. So in the beginning, yes, they were surprised, so they couldn't find how to answer that. So that's why I keep changing their narrative from the, in the beginning, it was a re-education camp and then say boarding school and then vocational school. Now they are admitting it is a de-extremism uh, education or brainwashing, now they are admitting it because that's the step they were taking uh, step by step backward. Yeah, that's the reason. Thank you. Uh, if I may add to that, um, sorry. Um, uh, I also think that um, the Chinese um, uh, leaders um, have had grown accustomed to a kind of a pliant West that would always kind of bracket human rights issues into the bracket of human rights, the kind of 
topic you talk about on the sidelines, separate meeting, then you have trade negotiations that are unaffected by what happens in those sidelined human rights dialogues. And that kind of arrangement has been going on for a long time, still is going on. Now it's cracking up, perhaps especially after the, the violent um, rejection from the regime to the United Nations report, denouncing it as lies coming from the United Nations. I think this probably will help um, 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 enlighten a lot of people in the West to the failure of those policies of the past. I think that our uh, in the West, our penchant for uh, uh, having meetings and then more meetings have kind of lulled the Chinese leadership into a sense that we can get away with anything. Um, I agree both my panelists and ju I just wish to add two things. Um, number one is uh, we can um, say that how the Chinese government surprise or reaction to the international community's reaction to the Uyghur issue and the pressure on China is quite similar to what um, the US officials visit um, Taiwan despite China's so much harsh warnings. It's quite similar to that one. But the one thing that I can bring up is um, the Chinese government tested uh, Western democracy, uh, liberal democracy for many, I mean, for a long time. Um, like, for example, the Chinese government's rep repression was there since 1949 against the Uyghurs, Tibetans, and any, any other minorities, but there was no uh, kind of uh, pressure or the reaction from the West. So that's why, you know, from time to time, the crackdown was continuing, and at its end up that they completely just start genocide against Uyghurs. So yes, it is surprised lately because the more harsher they gone, they thought that they can just keep going, whatever they do. But now they kind of realize that it's not, not every game goes with what, how China plans to. Uh, very briefly, uh, the Chinese government was surprised, um, but, but they don't care. So uh, their, their political purpose is the, um, to eliminate the uh, culture and uh, religious ethnic identity of the, the Uyghur people. But, but they, you know, they always uh, have the impunity and, and, and they, they are, that China uh, has become the second largest economy. It, was, it, it is very, very powerful in economy, technology, and military. So their mentality is, we committed, yeah, we, we commit uh, genocide, we, can, we, we put the, the, the people uh, to uh, the so-called uh, vacational training centers, so what? Okay, well, and with that um, very frank assessment, I think we're gonna call this panel. Uh, thank you again to everyone who spoke today, um, and thank you all for attending. And I think we have a five minute break.